Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, you know, it's a sunny day out and you're here. That's a, that's a thank you. Um, and thanks to UVM. This is a, a wonderful building and a wonderful, uh, um, this whole conference center is just terrific. So um, my, my plan today is to talk for about half an hour and then turn it over to question and answer. And um, um, the, the half an hour-ish presentation is a broad view of, um, of uh, nuclear issues and uh, then I, I'm assuming that the question and answers will get more uh, specific to the United States and, and to Vermont. But uh, um, there's so many similarities, I figured I would take a look at the, the, the overall condition of nuclear power and, and, and how we got to where we are right now. Um, okay, so this is Nuclear 101. And um, it's a good idea to start about how a, uh, how a nuclear power plant starts. There, there's a, a bunch of ways of making electricity. The, the first way is chemically, and solar cells make electricity chemically, no moving parts. Um, the other one is, is fuel cells. Um, there's something called a bloom box, which is a, a, about an 80% efficient process that converts a gas, methane, into electricity. Um, that, so chemical processes to make electricity have no moving parts. Um, now there's mechanical processes. And um, nuclear is a mechanical process, not a chemical process. Um, when um, uh, the, the two that I have are straight mechanical, wind power is mechanical, and, and so is hydroelectric. The, the bicycle on the side is also a mechanical way of producing power. Uh, basically, if you move a current, if you move magnetism through a field, you're going to create electricity. And that's what the bicycle does. Um, I'll give you an idea how little power comes out of a bicycle. Lance Armstrong can generate about maybe 500 watts of power continuously for maybe six hours. So that, that's a, so a professional athlete um, right at the top of his performance maybe can crank out 500, horse, uh, 500 watts, 500 watt bulbs for six hours and then he's exhausted. Now, so 500 times six hours is 3,000 watts or three kilowatts. Now we pay about 10 cents for a kilowatt. So having Lance Armstrong in our basement for six hours, pumping on a bicycle frantically is gonna generate about 30 cents worth of power. Now, and, and Lance Armstrong's gonna need 5,000 calories of food. So it's gonna cost about 50 bucks to feed this guy to get you the, so, uh, but mechanical generation of power through bicycles is, is not recommended, that's for sure. So, there's, as long as you can get a generator moving, you're going to get electricity. So that's mechanical power. Um, the bicycle, the hydroelectric, again, instead of having Lance Armstrong on the pedals, you're running the Winooski River through. The, through. Uh, so that's mechanical power. Within mechanical power is steam power. And that includes burning coal, burning oil, burning gas, and, and nuclear power, as well as geothermal. As long as there's a heat source involved, and you can convert that to steam, sooner or later you're going to be able to make electricity. So it's interesting. I mean, we've been burning, burning fuels to boil water for a couple thousand years anyway. Um, and it was just in the 1800s, end of the 1700s, when they figured out how to make a steam engine. And then, of course, steam engines evolved into steam power plants. And it's interesting, nuclear power was discovered, well, radiation was discovered about 110 years ago. Nuclear power itself was about 80 years ago. Um, and it's the least efficient way of making electricity through, um, uh, through steam. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but remind me that when we get back to that slide, nuclear has the lowest efficiency in converting the, the, the power into electricity of all these things. So the newest technology is actually the worst as far as the thermodynamic effects. Uh, what that means is it pumps out about 40% more heat per kilowatt into the river. So Vermont Yankee, if Vermont Yankee was a, um, a, a coal plant, uh, there, there are other issues, but as far as the heat goes, the heat from that plant would be much less than the heat from Vermont Yankee because of this inefficiency in the nuclear plant. So anyway, we've got a set 
of, of different ways of boiling water. And the last, most recent way of boiling water is nuclear, and it's the least efficient. Now, Albert Einstein had it right. Um, he said nuclear power is one hell of a way to boil water. Uh, I checked that reference three times, and, and uh, it, it's not just a one source reference, by the way. Okay, so how does a nuclear plant work? First off, that what differentiates nuclear from the others is that all the others, burning coal, burning oil, um, all involve a chemical reaction of, of electrons. They split the electrons and, and convert carbon into carbon dioxide. But nuclear isn't a chemical reaction. It happens inside the nucleus of the atom, hence it's nuclear. So that atom splits. A neutron that's that little green thing on the left collides with a uranium-235 atom and splits it in half. Now, there's a good part of that. A lot of heat is generated. And there's a bad part of it. Those two particles off on the side are also radioactive. And in the process, it gives off three more neutrons to perpetuate the reaction. So this was discovered in like 1930. And um, people realized, oh my god, there's about a million times more power generated in that reaction than there is in a comparable chemical reaction. And that's the big difference, is that pound for pound, uranium gives off an awful lot more energy than, than, than a, pound of, of, a pound of carbon. So the advantage is the heat in the middle per pound. The disadvantages are those two particles that float off, and we'll talk about those in a, in a minute. So about the end of the 1930s, people realized that not only did uranium split, but it split in such a way that it could then send off other neutrons that could cause more splitting, that could cause more splitting, that could cause more splitting. And this is the nuclear chain reaction. Now, Albert Einstein recognized this in like 1938 and wrote a letter to President Roosevelt saying, you could make a heck of a bomb with this. And it's, um, um, and based on Einstein's letter, the Manhattan Project began. But so a chain reaction they discovered that a, a nuclear atom split in half and gave a lot of energy. And about five years later, they said, oh my God, we can tie these things together and it will self-perpetuate. So this is how Vermont Yankee works. Uh, there are millions of these disintegrations every second inside Vermont Yankee. So on the far side of this slide, that, that's occurring millions of times a second. And that's what's creating all the heat that, that, um, that Vermont Yankee and, and any other nuclear unit uses. All right, now, how do you put this stuff to use? Um, in 1954, um, Eisenhower had the Atoms for Peace program, and um, basically we knew how to make this go uncontrollably into a bomb. And the um, scientists said, well, we think we can control it and make a power plant out of it. And the first one was shipping port, and then the Nautilus came by, and, and from there we've moved into commercial power. But it started as a military program with the Nautilus and the Navy program. But they all work the same way. This is a, uh, a boiling water reactor, like for my Yankee. There's an extra loop in pressurized water reactors, but it's the same deal. You've got, on, let's start on the far left, you've got a heat source. Now, in a nuclear plant, that's a nuclear core. But in a, in a, if th this could just as easily be McNeil Generating Station down here um, with, uh, with its wood-burning power plant. Um, as long as there's a source of heat, it's going to boil water. This source of heat is a nuclear reactor at low temperature steam. McNeil actually has higher temperature steam than a nuclear plant. Um, okay, so you've got the nuclear boiler creating bubbles, steam, that run up, and then that light blue line across the top is, um, is the um, steam that enters the turbine. And at this point, it's mechanical. It doesn't matter whether it's a nuclear plant or a coal plant. It's only the far left of that slide that really talks to the issue of, of nuclear power. It turns a turbine that's connected to a generator that sends electricity out to your house. Now, the back end of the cycle is that the, the steam has to be condensed into water 
and then pumped back into the nuclear reactor to begin the cycle all over again. And there's a second loop of river water that runs adjacent to the radioactive water, but doesn't contact it directly. And that's in a thing called the condenser. And the condenser is probably twice as big as this room, and it's a pretty big, huge room. Um, so it runs river water through one side of pipes that cools the steam and makes it water that then can be pumped back into the nuclear reactor. You can't pump steam. You need to get it back to water. So uh, when you hear about a power plant having a condenser leak, that's river water that leaks into the condenser. The pressures are such that the river water takes the, the river water goes into the reactor, it doesn't go the other way. When, when Vermont Yankee or another plant springs a condenser leak, it's dirty river water going into the nuclear reactor, not radioactive water going out into the river. There's other leaks that, that pollute the river, but the condenser leaks that have been endemic to Vermont Yankee are designed so it leaks in, not out. And, and then the cycle begins again. Um, and um, let's talk about the power that comes out of that nuclear reactor. Um, Vermont Yankee is a 650 megawatt plant, and that's roughly equivalent to 250, two, two and a half million horses. Two and a half million horsepower. And they're in a space that's 12 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet, roughly. So essentially a bedroom has two and a half million horses of power being generated in it. And so that's the advantage, but it's also the disadvantage, as you'll, as you'll see a little bit later. The, the, the beauty of nuclear compared to coal is that it's, it's, <laughs> the power can be in a very small area. The disadvantage to nuclear compared to coal is that the power can be in a very small area. The other issue, and I talked about this about two minutes ago, and that's the quality of the steam. A nuclear reactor churns out steam at less than 600 degrees. Um, the McNeil wood burner here in town uh, has hotter steam than that, and some coal plants have steam much hotter than that. The reason is the hotter the steam, the more efficient can be the turbine. But a nuclear plant can't have hot steam because then the fuel will begin to melt. And so the, the problem of, of nuclear as far as thermal pollution goes, the nuclear plants are 40% more thermally polluting than coal, gas, and, and, and oil plants, um, is that they have to run them at a low temperature to prevent the fuel from melting. So, um, so that's the big difference. So I, again, it's fascinating to me that the newest technology, and it's 80 years old, it's hardly new technology anymore. You know, we all think of nuclear as the, 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 the greatest invention on the block in the last 10 years or something. We're talking about something that was discovered in 1930 here. Um, the, the newest invention in all the ways of heating water is the least efficient. Okay, so the advantages of nuclear are mainly that you get an enormous amount of power out of a very little mass. Um, a truckload or two or three, no more than three truckloads of fuel, um, are all that's required to run Vermont Yankee for a year. Now, if that were a comparable coal plant, it would be a train load a day. So the, the advantage becomes the disadvantage shortly, but the advantage of having an enormous amount of power in a very small space is that it doesn't use a lot of, um, of uh, material. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there are not front-end problems in this process. The uranium mining is, um, uh, is a significant um, scar on the environment. Um, and the reason there is that the, the quality of uranium has gradually dropped way, way down. Um, the Belgian Congo was where uranium was uh, initially uh, discovered. And the ore in the Belgian Congo was close to 1% uranium. And um, that's what started the Manhattan Project with Belgian Congo ore. And, well, that quickly got used up. And now, then we went down to a tenth of a percent uranium. And now we're down at a hundredth of a percent uranium. So in a ton, the Belgian Congo ore had 2,000 pounds, kicked the decimal 20 pounds. Then it, now we're at two pounds. Now we're at two tenths of a pound. And we're very rapidly he he heading toward two hundredths of a pound of uranium in a ton of earth. 
So we're stripping the, the, the planet of the, the, high, um, the high density uranium and going for um, smaller and smaller quantities of, of, rate of uranium in a pound of Earth. Um, a, a source of uranium is the uh, Jordanian desert. Um, and it's at a thousandth of a percent. And believe it or not, uranium prospectors are looking at Jordan saying, uh, you know, 20 years out, we can take that whole desert and for, for every pound, we'll get 0 0.001 pounds of uranium out of it. So it's, it, it is becoming an incredible um, venture as far as the, the mining end goes. So when you hear clean, safe, reliable, you've you got to look at this whole cycle. And I'll talk about the other end of the cycle. But the front end of the cycle, uh, and we talk about mountaintop mining in West Virginia, the same thing's happening in, in uranium mining. Because the quality of uranium that we're discovering now is nowhere near what was available in the 1940s. Okay, so the disadvantages get back to those two pieces of uh, um, called daughter products. When you split the uranium, the daughter products are the, um, are the disadvantages. And that's that and that. So there's your uranium. It splits, and the two daughter products are the uranium. If this stopped at, at, at uh, giving off an enormous amount of heat, we wouldn't be here today. Um, but the problem is what's left after the split. So the daughter products have two main problems associated with them. One is that they're physically hot for on the order of three, four, five, six, seven years. And the second one is that they're radio, radioactive for centuries. So you know, I'll talk about each one of those separately. Um, a lot of people didn't realize about the physical heat until Chernobyl happened and then Fukushima. I guess I want to, before I, I, I skip the slide in my mind here, um, those daughter products emit radiation and there's four types of radiation. Um, the four types are, there's three of them are particles, physical things, an alpha particle, a beta particle, and a neutron. And the other one is a gamma ray. And so th this is an electromagnetic spectrum on the bottom there. And light is a ray. And as light gets more energetic, it becomes ultraviolet. More energetic still, it becomes x-rays. And more energetic still, it becomes a gamma ray. So these gamma rays that a nuclear power plant emits are nothing but a high energy x-ray. What's going on there, though, and we'll talk about the gamma first. Um, gammas penetrate you from the outside. So, for instance, if you're near Vermont Yankee, the, the, the reactor and the turbine are giving off what they call sky shine. And those are gamma rays that bounce off of the air molecules and rain back down on, um, on the Earth. Um, very similar to an X-ray. There's not a lot of scientific argument about the effect of an external gamma ray on your body. The scientific arguments come about the effect of those other particles, the alpha particle, the beta particle, and the neutron, when they get inside you. And this is what, what's called a hot particle. So um, these are much larger particles, but they don't penetrate as far. So if I had an alpha emitter and I laid it on my skin, it would, would not even penetrate the first layer of my skin. Same with a beta particle. Neutron's a little different. But so they're not penetrating when they're outside your body. But the problem becomes when you ingest them by breathing or um, uh, drinking them in or, or eating them in, then they launch in an organ. And the scientific argument that's occurring right now is over the effect not of the radiation that shines down on people, but on the effect of the radiation that you get inside your body. So that's what um, the big argument is about. Now, there's two camps here in the scientific community. The um, Nuclear Industry and Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Japanese government, um, all subscribe to the um, International Council on Radiation Protection, ICRP. Um, and I call that the uh, Bobby McFarlane camp, you know, the, the don't worry, be happy camp. <laughs> and, and on the other side, there's the ECRR and like-minded scientists. And the issue is what that radiation does when it gets in your body. Yes? What's the ECRR? 
uh, European Commission on Radiological Risk. Um, there are other groups too, but, but just on the on the opposite poles, there are there are some other ones. Yes, ECRR is European Commission on Radiological Risk. Um, yes. Oh, when, when, when you hear, you know, you get about as much radiation um, flying in an airplane. You know, as you're, that, those issues about a millirem of external radiation falling on you, um, I don't think either of the parties, and it's actually a much broader spectrum, but we'll call it the, the, uh, uh, the, the oh my God, it's really bad, and the don't worry, be happy camps. Um, those are, between those two, um, they would still agree that a flight on an airplane is relatively inconsequential um, because it's external radiation. But the, the, the problem becomes when, um, when the particle is ingested, that's where the big scientific discrepancy uh, begins. The, Yeah, um, I'll take a bunch of questions later, but the, this gamma radiation that's shining down, um, we are bombarded every day by cosmic rays. And the, um, um, the cosmic rays we're bombarded on are about 100 millirem a, a year. And everybody in the, on the one camp will say, well, if we can withstand these gamma rays, a, a little cesium atom in our lungs is no big deal. So that issue of... Um, um, comparing an external exposure, which most scientists don't argue about, versus the internal uh, exposure of picking up a hot particle is, is um, the, the issue where scientific, scientists disagree. Okay, so um, now on that, here's the difference. And uh, the, the, there are, uh, I'm sure there's thousands and thousands of pages written about this difference. But the difference basically is that if you get some cesium inside your body or any other isotope. Um, what the ICRRP, the ICRP group would say is they'll take the energy emitted by that radioactive cesium and they'll average it over most of the whole organ. So if I've got a cesium particle lodged in my lung, they'll average that energy over my whole lung. Now what the other scientists feel is that that's really not fair. What's happening is that that energy is not dissipated over the whole lung. It doesn't go very far at all. But in the distance it goes, it creates much destruction. So the opposite camp is saying that the, uh, the, the radiation does a lot of local damage. And once you've created that local damage, sometimes your body generates a cancer as a result. So the, the difference in the camps is do I average that energy over the whole lung, or do I average it over a, a relatively small area around the particle? Now, I, I just had a great explanation of this explained to me um, just about two days ago, and I'm going to share it with you. The, the ICRP, the, the Bobby McFarlane crowd, it, it thinks of a lung as, think of a stadium with, a, with 100,000 people in it. Okay, that's, that's the whole lung. And in the middle is somebody with a high-powered rifle and 10 rounds of ammunition. Well, that person fires 10 times into the crowd. The ICRP's position is that, well, on average, that energy didn't hurt much. <laughs> now, the, the flip side of that argument is that the ECRR and, and those other scientists realize that 10 people up there, it really hurt a lot. And the other 900 and... 999, whatever, the remainder of the group in the stadium had, had no exposure. So that basically is the difference in the two camps. I subscribe to the, the camp that there's a lot of local damage caused. Not all the time does it cause cancer. A lot of times your body will isolate it or, or repair it, but it's more cancer, cancerous than the International Council would um, would would suggest now um, the, the I, there's a gonna, we have a book here and it's put out by by three uh, doctors and physicists that um, act, that that are in the camp that supports this very local high energy exposure. Um, it's called Chernobyl Consequences of a Catastrophe, and its um, primary author is a guy named Yablokov. Um, this it, 
this is beginning to turn the tide. Um, the ICRP um, was trying to say that basically Chernobyl killed almost no one. Yabakov saying it's more than a million. And the data on Chernobyl is beginning to support Yablokov as opposed to the ICRP. So I think the tide is changing here. Uh, but you know, Chernobyl was 25 years ago. So you'll hear um, health physicists talk about the um, uh, um, health physicists or people that do this for a living. Um, we'll talk about Fukushima being, um, I've heard numbers as low as maybe a couple hundred people may die of cancer, and I've heard numbers say as many as two million may die of cancer. And the difference is not really about that external cloud that the plant released in the first day or two. The difference is about what the people are inhaling now or imbibing now that stays in the ecosystem for a long, long time. So, all right, let's go to my next slide here. So, the daughter products have two problems. The first one is heat. Um, we really didn't know too much, uh, the scientists did, but, but I don't think it was really publicly understood that when you shut a nuclear reactor down, you don't shut a nuclear reactor down. It, the chain reaction stops. There's no more splitting of the uranium. That happens immediately. So when you hear the reactor's been shut down safely, that means the splitting has stopped. But these pieces, these daughter products, remain physically hot for years. And it, at Fukushima, for instance, let's talk about that two and a half million horses. When the reactor shuts down, there's still 5% of the horses still in the room. The 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 150,000 horses in your bedroom. That's a lot of heat that has to be gotten rid of. And of course, at Fukushima, they didn't get rid of the heat, and, and the consequences are right there, uh, right there to be seen. Now, Fukushima is exactly uh, the same as Fukushima 2 and 3 are exactly the same as Vermont Yankee. Uh, Fukushima 1 is slightly older um, and if you look at it from, um, from left to right, it's Fukushima 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this picture was taken before Unit 4 <coughs> blew up but while Unit 4 was on fire. So um, the two smoldering buildings there are Unit 3 and Unit 4. Um, their containments are designed to contain the radiation. Uh, I, I think we can all agree it didn't work. It didn't work not just once, not just twice. It didn't work three times out of the three times it was tried. So this is the first real test of a, um, of a boiling water reactor containment, and it went 0 for 3. Um, the, the consequences there will be, will, will be uh, determined over years and years. So Vermont Yankee has the same containment. Um, there's a vent on the containment that was designed to be opened. Now this is interesting because this containment was designed by guys using slide rules in the 60s. By the early 70s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission realized that this containment was not a good design. And there's actually memos that say we never should have licensed this, but if we say no now, we'll kill the industry. So the, those, uh, then in the 80s, they realized this is a really bad design, so the vents were added in the 80s to a design that was built in the 60s. Containments and venting don't go together. You know, if you're going to contain something, the last thing you want to do is open a spigot to let it out. Um, and what happened at Fukushima is these containment vents that were added in the 80s to correct a problem from the 60s didn't work anyway. Um, there's 30... Well, there's 23 reactors in the United States identical to this. For my Yankees, one, Pilgrim's one, Oyster Creek is one on the East Coast. Um, inland, there's a, there's a bunch in Illinois right near Chicago. There's, uh, uh, the Dresden units, for example, are right near Chicago. And those are even older. Those are very similar to Fukushima 1, which is the first one to blow. And then there's some in the South, Hatch and um, uh, Browns Ferry at uh, Tennessee Valley Authority. So they're spread out throughout the, the, uh, the country. And then there's another couple dozen elsewhere, including Germany. And Germany actually decided to shut those down now, not, not 10 years from now, but they're shutting down these old boiling water reactors now. And then there's a bunch in Japan, too. So this, this containment design that was designed to contain this heat from that splitting didn't work and um, the Japanese are having second thoughts, the Germans are having second thoughts, and the American Nuclear Regulatory Commission says it's not a problem, it can't happen here. Um, 
And actually, there's no planned modifications on these containments as a result of Fukushima right now. Okay, so problem number one was when these things split, they give off a lot of heat. Engineers knew that. They built the containments, and the containments have failed three times out of three. Problem number two is that even when they stop giving off heat, they remain radioactive for, for centuries. Um, this is an example of, of cesium-137. It's got a 30-year half-life. And, and a lot of people say, well, in, in 30 years, half is gone. In the next 30 years, the other half is gone. No, it doesn't work that way. In 30 years, half is gone. So if there was a million cesium particles, in 30 years, you're down to 500,000. In the next 30 years, half of those are gone. So you're down to 250,000. The next 30 years, half of those are gone. You're down to 125,000. Well, what this means for Fukushima is that they've discovered radioactive straw at about 50 miles away from Fukushima. That's at 600,000 disintegrations per second in the straw, in a pound of straw, not much straw. And so what that means, if you, if you keep that straw for a, mo a month, it's not going to decay away. A year, it's not going to decay away. 30 years, it'll go from 600,000 to 300,000. That's still not good. You really have to keep this stuff out of harm's way for 300 years before, it's completely, before it completely goes away. Uh, the concept is 10 half-lives. So if it's a 30-year half-life multiplied by 10, and after 10 of those <coughs> divisions, it will get small enough that it's essentially impossible to, um, to measure. The iodine, which we heard about and we were concerned about in milk, had an eight-day half-life. So in 80 days, it was essentially gone from the milk. Uh, the issues are mainly cesium and strontium, which is a, um, strontium is a bone seeker, and cesium is a muscle seeker. And so they attack different parts of your body, and the plants give both of them off uh, extensively. So the, the, um, if, if you remember your periodic chart, and I'm sure we all have the periodic chart burned in our head from some high school science teacher, right? Um, if you look at, uh, when you have a cramp, you're supposed to eat a banana because it has potassium. Well, potassium and cesium are, are right above each other in the periodic chart, so they mimic each other. So cesium goes to your muscles. After Chernobyl, the, there was a, um, a diagnosed new illness, if you will, called Chernobyl heart. Um, well, the heart's a muscle, and the, the radioactive cesium from Chernobyl went to the kids' hearts. There's a lot of heart damage after Chernobyl from this cesium deposition in the heart. Uh, strontium, if you remember, that's a little bit further out in a different column in the table. It's right under calcium. So it goes to your bones, and it damages your, your um, uh, marrow which, of course, create white blood cells and can cause leukemia. So um, depending on the, the isotope, they have different organs which they, which they attack. Okay. Um, let's flip and see where we're next. Okay. Now there's one other problem that, I, uh, that, that doesn't revolve around the splitting of the, of the atom. A uranium-235 molecule can split and create the heat. Well, only about 5% of the molecules in that reactor are uranium-235. The others are uranium-238. Uranium-238 doesn't split. What it does is it absorbs a neutron. That's what that top line is. The, the, the blue N hitting the yellow U is uranium-238 being hit by a neutron. It goes through a couple of um, very quick changes and in the next day becomes plutonium. Now, plutonium is, so plutonium is not a radioactive daughter product. It didn't result from uranium being split. It resulted from uranium-238 picking up a neutron, and it basically becomes a bigger, newer molecule. Now, it's got a half-life of 24,000 years. And so in, if, we, if we use this analogy again, a, a, a million in 24,000 years becomes a half a million, and 24,000 years becomes 250,000, becomes 125,000, 75,000 years in the future. So we're creating a waste in plutonium that remains radioactive for 10 half-lives, or a quarter of a million years. Now, this is a dollar bill. This is roughly a gram. It, uh, I, I teach um, physics, and if people want to 
you know, we all think in pounds because we're, we're, we're English, but uh, if you think in grams, the dollar bill is roughly a gram. A microgram, a millionth of this, if it's plutonium, is lethal. Individually lethal. So one microgram of plutonium is, is lethal. And that's another problem. So we've got the relatively short-term problem. We only have to worry about the cesium stuff for the next 300 years. But then we've got... Then we've got this other problem of the plutonium that we have to worry about for a quarter of a million years. Um, the title, Into Eternity, is the name of a movie um, that's been out now for about six months. And it's a breathtaking movie made in Sweden that discusses the Swedes have nuclear power plants. And they've decided, okay, we're going to take care of this problem. We're going to build our own waste dump for us. We're not going to take care of the Germans, or the French, or the Americans. We're going to take care of our own and we're going to build our own dump. And it talks about that process. This is the entryway into the, um, um, the Swedish dump. It's, it's in a granite formation on an island way, way up on the North Sea. And it's um, designed to have access for the next uh, century so they can put the fuel in. And then it's designed to be destroyed so nobody can get back in to, to, uh, to be damaged by the fuel. So the pyramids lasted. 5,000 years, this has to last 45 times longer than the pyramids. We're talking about, you know, man started civilization 10,000 years ago, so we're talking about 24 times longer than, than uh, uh, people have been able to communicate using language. Uh, and w this facility has to remain intact to prevent that plutonium from getting in the environment. Well, it's interesting, this movie Into Eternity talks about how do you put a sign on this building to warn people? And if you think about it, now, language, if you, you know, old English, gosh, I can't understand a thing from Beowulf, right? You know, I don't even know if that was old English, I'm sorry. I'm sure somebody here does. You know, it, so in a, less than a thousand years, we can't even understand what people said. And we're talking about putting a don't, uh, you know, keep out, danger keep out sign that's got to be understandable to people for the next quarter of a million years. So that was part of this, this, this movie, Into Eternity, is, is about that. So there, it's interesting, though. So the goal of this facility is to protect mankind from the plutonium. So we are generating plutonium in our lifetimes to watch Golden Girls on TV or Michael Jackson's funeral or, or whatever that's creating a waste that has to be, that has to be uh, guarded for the next quarter of a million years, for that one hour of enjoyment watching your television screen. It's, a, it's an interesting thing to discuss. So this facility has, I thought this facility had one purpose. And a couple months ago, I was talking to a scientist, he says, no, he says, there's a second problem. The first problem I always thought, and the only problem I always thought, was to protect mankind from the plutonium. But there's another problem. We have to protect the plutonium from mankind. Now, you know, there's guys like Hitler that come along every now and then that want to, you know, destroy their neighbor. And if you know that a substance down there can make the greatest bomb in the world, what's to prevent a nefarious civilization a couple hundred years from now from drilling down to get it? So if we put the warning sign out to tell people stay away from here, the people, that protects the, us from the plutonium. But if we put that same sign out, it allows people to discover it and dig back down to make a weapon out of it in the future. So there's a real dichotomy here about should we maybe not even put a sign on this building, on this hunk of rock, and hope that over the next hundred years or a couple hundred years people will forget it's ever there and, and make it less likely. So we have to protect mankind from the plutonium, but we also have to protect the plutonium from mankind. The, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the, is the picture up here on the, um, on the top. That's a, a, a plutonium not atom, a piece of plutonium lodged in a lung of, a, of, a, of an ape. And the, um, the tracks that you see are individual alpha particles that are shooting out and damaging parts of the lung. And this gets back to that ICRP, ECRR debate. The, um, the ICRP, the International Council, the Bobby McFarlane Group, would say that, well, that energy gets averaged out over the whole lung. It's not a problem. And the 
the, um, the, the other camp would say, no, just look at this radiograph. And it's not getting averaged out over a large mass of that lung. In fact, it's very concentrated in a very local, um, local location. Um, and I think that's it. All right. Thank you.